Hello! Do not attempt to adjust your television set. I am not Guy Royce with a new beard job and a haircut. It is me, Justin, and I am actually here to host and present uh, because Guy is going to be presenting today, which is super exciting. Um, today is an extra special edition of Redis Monthly Live because we have four presenters, all Redis developer advocates, and they're all going to be presenting on our new client, which is super, super excited. So welcome to Redis Monthly Live, and we're going to be introducing Redis Ohm. We're going to have Simon, Guy, Brian, and Steven all with us today. Um, super, super exciting. So I want you to first remember, you can join us on our meetups on meetups.redis.live slash redis-live. Uh, so you can always you know, stay informed as when we're actually going to have these. Uh, subscribe to us on our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash redisinc. You'll see us talking about all sorts of topics, streaming live and um, from the past. Also, follow us on Twitch, on twitch.tv slash redislabs. Also, join our Discord channel. We are always on our Discord channel, always chatting it up. If you have any questions or specific use cases you want you know, help with, go ahead and check out Discord. And as always, listen to our tweets on our Twitter, twitter.com, Redis, Inc. So I want to get that out of the way so we can actually talk to all of our friends. So let me bring everybody in. Hello, Simon. Hello, Guy. Hello, Steve. Hello, Brian. Howdy, howdy. Hey, how you doing? Hello. So to defrost the warmth in the room a little bit, let me just uh, ask a, a seasonal question. Um, everybody tends to have, no matter what, during the holidays, some sort of dish or drink or tradition that they either can't stand or absolutely love. So I want to ask you, if there is a seasonal dish, drink, or activity that you absolutely love or hate, uh, and I'll give you an example. I absolutely love my grandmother's wine cake. She mixes a funky, funky wine with um, yes. with nuts and raisins and chocolate chips, and it looks like a burnt black brick, but it is the most delicious thing. And hopefully, she's not she's not watching us right now. Um, great, yeah, thanks. Grandma's wine nice. cake. <laughs> what, nice. what else is everybody's favorite or worst? Are we around Rob, Robin it? Am I next because I'm clockwise to you? Yeah, yeah, let's go for Steve. All right, sounds good. Um, I guess, I guess what I like, uh, what I look forward to around Christmas is um, my standing rib roast, which I make every year. Um, so I've got to actually go out to Publix and pick one up in a couple of days for to cook and. Yeah, I'll make that and all the fixings, and I'll be good to go for Christmas dinner. Very nice. Very nice. Simon. Nice. Um, hopefully, mine's not a, like sort of double lost in translation. So we get Twiglets, which are like packets of sort of wheat-based snacks, and they look like twigs, and they're a bit sticky, and they're sort of brown, and they're coated in something that's like Marmite, which is a sort of yeast extract that is a very polarizing taste. People either love it or hate it. Marmite actually markets itself on love it or hate it. Um, and I can just basically sit and eat those all day with TV on. But for whatever reason, they're available all year. Just never get them at any other time of the year. It's like Christmas twiglets. Yeah, right. Let's do that. That's me. Christmas twiglets. <laughs> so if right. we're doing uh, clockwise, I guess I'm next and not Brian. I'm, I'm oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go yeah. clockwise. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of things that I really like around Christmas time. Uh, there's several recipes that we make. I've been munching on. I mean, the thing I like about the, the food around the holidays is, is I, I do keto. And so I don't eat a lot of carbohydrates. Uh, but I, of course, make an exception for Christmas. And so like my wife makes fudge, which I've been uh, snacking on. And she makes these cream cheese cookies where it's basically uh, a yellow cake mix with cream cheese and a bunch of sugar. And you bake them up with cookies and they're amazing. But probably my favorite uh, holiday food, which we do on Thanksgiving and around Christmas, is uh, pecan pie or pe pecan pie. Mm -hmm. How do you say that? Pecan? Pecan? Pecan, pecan pie. I'm gonna go very pecan polarizing. Pie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, pecan pie is hands down uh, my favorite pie uh, in existence. It's as sweet as sweet can be, and it's got pecans in it. What's not the like? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I also love pecan pie. I, I like to add bourbon. 
uh, before yes. and after baking uh, for flavor. <laughs> you, you can do bourbon and you can put chocolate chips and coconut. I've had that variety where it's pecans, coconut, chocolate chips, and then the, like the corn syrup based gel that's in it that makes it super sweet. Yeah. And then I had bourbon. And it's like it's booze and everything. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, beat that. <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to go uh, familiar. Um, the uh, My mom makes this uh, Caribbean uh, eggnog, which, uh, you know, it's like supermarket eggnog. Just I can't even touch that stuff. Uh, this is so thick that it's basically semi-liquid flan. Uh, it has enough Caribbean rum to basically raise the dead. Uh, so it's 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 amazing. I mean, but like three or four glasses and you your cholesterol will be through the roof uh, and you'll likely be asleep. But it is so good. Oh, that sounds amazing. I'm 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 hoping that Redis can um, give us a group discount on Lipitor after <laughs> after our season here. <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you everyone hope you all get to enjoy your favorite treats that all sounds delicious uh let's let's start let's start talking about redis ohm uh simon i believe that you are first and um, okay I, let's try it out you know hop off and you have the floor all right so i'm gonna go ahead and um share my desktop but first before i do that um just sort of really quickly what is the Redis Ohm family of clients? So there's four of them right now. Um, they are basically higher level modern clients for Redis that allow you to do common things. And in this first preview release, it's object modeling and sort of searching and secondary indexing. It allows you to do those at a much higher level of abstraction than you would previously have done with other clients. Um, they're from us here at Redis and they're open source and they are for uh, Python, JavaScript, Spring Java, and .NET. So without further ado, I am going to do a couple of things here. I am going to share my desktop. Um, and before we even talk about Redis Ohm, we're going to talk about what are you doing here, Simon? So um, I am not naturally the, uh, the developer advocate for Python here at Redis. We are aligned by programming language uh, rather than, say, geography or product. So Steve is the uh, .NET advocate, Brian Java, um, Guy Node, and myself sort of Node, and I manage part of the team. Um, we currently have a vacancy for Python. So this evening, it's me talking about Python, which is not my natural sweet spot. But if you can do this talk better than me, which you probably can, then um, please feel free to hit us up here on our careers site and apply for this job that is currently open. So it's a uh, job on our team, uh, working on the Redis own Python client, but also appearing on streams like this, speaking at conferences, making videos, blogs, and all the other DevRel content. So that was like the only thing that I've got to plug other than let's look at a, a Python client. Um, so what are we doing here? I've got, um, I've got some example code. And what I'm aiming to show here is a couple of things from the Python preview. So. Uh, rather than just run Redis commands with this client, which you can do with any client, including this one, I wanted to look at some of those higher level underlying commands and let the power of the client and the modeling language and Redis search do things for us. So what I've got is a whole load of uh, adoptable animal data here. So imagine I'm running a uh, animal shelter and we take in dogs and cats and we try and find them a new home. And when we take them in, we ask people some stuff about their history and maybe we observe them in the shelter and, and learn a little bit about them. So we have all of this stuff about each animal. So we're storing its name, species, age, weight, and some other attributes like, is it known to be good with children? Uh, can it live with other animals? And then we have a free text description. Um, and what we might want to do with this data would be build a website or something that allows people to look at what animals are available and maybe drill down into that and search because you know people are going to have criteria they're going to want a cat that is like a certain age maybe and we that we know is good with children or can live with another cat or a dog so this sort of data here is um essentially a, a series of name value pairs so you know each name up there is the field so name species and so on and the values are things you see so this kind of lends itself well to a redis hash so 
Let's first look at how we can model that in Redis Ohm. So over here, I've got a, um, a model for that data. And this is a Redis Ohm model. So I'm importing a couple of things from there. I need a field. And I'm using what's called a hash model as my base. So this basically says that this thing that we're modeling, it's going to live in a hash in Redis. But we don't really need to know too much about that because this is a higher level client. So I have a class here that I've called adoptable. So each of our animals is an adoptable. Um, and they have all of those things you saw in the CSV. So the name here is going to be a string. And then here we're telling Redis Ohm that this is a field that we need to store in Redis. And also we want to index it. Now, underneath, it's going to index that with Redis search. And it's going to build and maintain a search index for us. And we don't have to deal with those things because the own client is going to do that for us as we build instances of this model and save them into Redis. So what we've got here is all of these fields. They're a combination of strings. And then we've got a few integers. So age, we want a precise number of years. We don't care if the animal's three and a half. We want to know if it's three or four. Whereas weight, we might want to know that it is like 42.1 pounds as opposed to 39.9 pounds. Um, this description field down here is a little bit different as well as just indexing it i'm telling redis ohm how to tell redis to index it so i'm saying i want to index this so i want to be able to search on it and i want to do a full text search on it and that's going to use the power of redis search all of this is but that will use the um the full text query part of redis search the rest is essentially building secondary indexes so if you're familiar with redis already and how you might model things in hashes Generally, you store everything at a key. So we might have, you know, adoptable colon 1000 for dog with or animal with ID 1000, which will be a unique thing. And then we would have a hash that has name and species and age and stuff. And that's great if we want to get everything. So we can just scan and find all the adoptable things. And it's great if we know the animal's tag number, so like 1000. But that's not how fasted search works in the real world. So people don't look for like, you know, animals that have tag number 1000 or 1002. They look for animals that are dogs and are maybe called Rex and might be, you know, in the sort of 30 to 50 pound weight range. So this is where Redis search underneath is going to help us. It's going to build and maintain an index over these hashes and then allow us to query that. So now we've got this model and this data, what we need to do is load it into Redis somehow. Um, Redis Ohm, this becomes pretty simple. So we basically uh, import my adoptable class that I defined. And I'm going to open ooh, open the uh, CSV file here. And I'm not going to do anything spectacular with it. This is Python standard CSV reader. So we're going to read a line out of that. and. Oh, sorry, we're going to set up a reader that's going to skip over the headline. And then we're going to read a line out of the uh, animal file until we haven't got any left. And for each one, we're just going to pass in the Python dict that the CSV reader creates straight into my adoptable constructor, make an adoptable thing for it. Now, there's two things going on here afterwards. So number one here, I'm just printing some outputs. I'm saying, well, what's the animal's name? And then I have this field called peak. K. So PK wasn't defined in my model. It's not in my data set. So what's that? Um, it's a thing that Redis Ohm's created for this model. So it's a primary key. So this is a ULID ID, which is a standard. And all of the Redis Ohm clients use that. So you probably hear a lot about that tonight. But it's been created on the client here without having to do a round trip to the database to say, hey, get me an ID or get me the next set of IDs that I might use for new things I'm creating. And it's going to be unique across all instances of that. So we can create IDs locally before saving them to the database, and we know we'll be OK. And to put it in Redis, I literally just do adoptable.save, so store it. Um, I don't need to know what Redis commands are being used to do that. Uh, the own client's going to manage that for me. And then once we've looped around all of those, loaded everything, I need to run this thing called the own migrator, which in Python is a thing that will look at the models that we've stored and look for those indexed fields, make a Redis search index for them, and go ahead and create or modify that index for me. And from now on in, the Redis search module is going to track changes and uh, index all of this data in near real time. So I'll then be able to make some queries. 
So that all sounds great, but it's all code and it's all theory. So let's actually do something. So over here, I've got another new toy. This is the Redis uh, Insight. It's a preview version, which you can download and try out. Um, and it's a slightly different interface from the previous one because it's more like an application. Previous one used to run in a web browser. But if I hit this, I've got a completely empty Redis database here. This has got the Redis search module installed because we're going to use some secondary indexing. And if I go ahead here and do uh, Python load adoptables, I just want to type node all the time. And it's Python. Um, here we go. So what it's done is it's loaded all of those adoptable things, and we printed out all of their PKs or the ULIDs that were created for them. So not very uh, interesting output. But if I now go here and refresh this, you'll see I have all of these hashes in here. And Redis Ohm's done another thing for me. So it's created key names based on the model. So the model was called adoptable. The scope for that was adoptable. And this is my ULID. So it's created a unique uh, key for this animal. We've stored PK in there. And then we've stored all of these other things that, um, that I had in the CSV. So everything's in this flat hash. So it does that. Uh, we have all the data in the database here. I can clear this. And then the next thing we need to do is actually make use of it and query it. So now we've got all of this in here. We want to ask, ask some questions like, oh, find a dog that, or find an animal that has a certain name or find all the male dogs or find all the dogs that are in a certain age range or something a little bit less well-defined. So I want a cat that's good with children, whatever that means. So we can see what uh, that means and how it works. If I expand one of these. The way that we find things with Redis Ohm is uh, we know what sort of thing we're looking for. So we want an adoptable, the animals that I'm I'm storing here. So I basically just say adoptable.find, and then I pass in a uh, search criteria. So I'm saying I want the adoptables name field to be Luna. So we're looking for animals that are called Luna. And then what do I want back? I'd like all of them, please. So. This is managing with a more sort of fluent interface that, again, you'll hear a lot about tonight in the other clients, that query structure. Uh, so we don't need to learn or deal with the underlying Redis search query uh, language. This proxies that for us. So when I run that, we can expect to find all of the dogs, or sorry, all of the adoptables that are called Luna. So if I do Python query adoptables.py is Luna. It's the only one that comes back. So remember, we didn't have a way of getting things by Luna. That's been done by the secondary indexing for us. That's all happening in the background. So no code required. Um, if we then look at some of these other ones, if I want to find male dogs, I can start stacking these queries up. So I can say adoptable.find where the species is a dog and the sex flag is set to M, so male dog. And that will do what we expect. Find dogs in age range. Again, I could say species is dog, and we're not limited to just doing text matches on this indexing. If you remember, we indexed some of these fields as integers and some as floats, so age was an integer. So I could say where the age is greater than eight and the age is less than 11, which basically means I'm going to get dogs that are age nine or 10. And then when I've got that sort of information back, I can then also do something like sort it. So I can say, I now want them sort, sorted by age. So all of this um, filtering and indexing and searching and sorting will happen on the server in Redis search, and then the client will bring them the results back and present them to us. So if I do try running this one and not that one, then let's see what happens when we run this again. Here we go. So we get. There are three dogs that are age nine or 10, and we've sorted them by age. So we got the age nine ones first, and then the older 10-year-old is last. Uh, we could flip that sort, as you'd expect, if we wanted to. Clear that. Then just really quickly going back to my model here, this description field we indexed uh, slightly differently. So we said we wanted full text search over that. And if we go back to the data, the description itself is uh, sort of open-ended text. So it's just basically notes from a previous owner or the handler in the uh, shelter, uh, and a little bit of a sell on what the animal's looking for based on what we know about it. So you know this will contain 
information about um, the animal's history or whether it's been good with children in the past or its nature, as well as these sort of more binary, is it good with children, is it good with other animals, yes, no flags. So if we're trying to answer a question such as, um, I want to find a cat that's good with children, which might be a common thing that people who come into the shelter are looking for. Oops, then I can collapse these out and open this one. And let's say one way that we could write a query that would allow us to find cats that are good with children would be say, okay, find me adoptables where the species is a cat and the children flag is explicitly set to yes. So whoever determines that has said, yeah, that this cat's good with children by whatever test we use for that. And then we're going to go fishing around in that description uh, field. And we're going to look for words that the percentage kind of means like, so or um, begin with or sound like. So we're going to go with words like play. So playful, playing, play. And then we're going to look for um, words like anxious, but we don't really want that. So we want a cat that's quite confident, but good with children. So we use the tilde here, which negates that. So we're basically saying, so uh, play or playful and oops, not anxious and not nervous. So essentially this query is saying, find all the cats where the child flag is yes, and the description backs that up because it contains play or playful or playing or words like that. And it doesn't contain thing, things like anxious or nervous or nervously and so forth. So this is using both sort of powers of Redis search, the secondary indexing and the full text search. So if I swap over to running that and we run it, then what we'll see is we've got a few cats that fit those criteria, which is great. So maybe somebody's going to go home with a new cat as part of this talk. Um, and that was really what I got. There's one more thing I wanted to mention, which is uh, when we're modeling data here in uh, our hash model, which is in here, we uh, are modeling a flat sort of name value space inside the class here. Not all data conforms to that. So there's also a JSON model that you can use and that uses the Redis JSON uh, module underneath to allow you to model more nested data structures. So don't think that you're limited to flat name values. That's just what I happened to show today. And also these uh, models here, they're actually Pydantic models. So if you're familiar with Pydantic, which is a validation library, then you could put additional criteria on here. So we could have a field in here, email, and we could index it as something more specific than a string. And then the model itself will check that when we're creating and trying to save and also trying to load uh, instances to and from it. And we can you know, put range criteria on integers and all the things that you can do with Pydantic, which might be something you're already familiar with working with. So that was really all I've got, um, other than, again, if you think you can do this talk better than me, please do come talk to us. We are hiring right now for a developer advocate to do exactly this sort of work. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. That was really cool. No problem. I wish that service was around when I was looking for my cats. I had to end up going all the way to Sacramento, California to find Sweet Basil, and if only I knew <laughs> previously. <laughs> Um, yeah, great stuff. Also, a quick promotion. Uh, Simon and I are going to be working on a new course uh, that is uh, Redis Search and Python. And it's kind of like an, it's like an extension of the course that's already out there, RU203, Querying, Indexing, and Full Text Search uh, with Redis. So stay tuned. You'll be seeing a lot more of Simon. And we'll also be exploring these Redis Ohm clients within that um, course. So... Uh, thank you very much, Simon. Uh, next up, we have Brian. Brian, Brian, I'm so excited to see this. I haven't seen you in a while because you've been working so hard on the client. So um, cool. Are you excited as much as I am? I am. I am. And uh, yeah, I've been kind of heads down working on this library. And uh, it's uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I mean, it's it's just the beginning of it. And uh, now we're trying to kind of build momentum, uh, get contributions, get ideas. And, uh, but I think we have a pretty good core now that we can build upon. Very exciting. And again, uh, if anybody has any questions in the audience, please do not hesitate to ask. Um, we're all in the um, chat 
right now so we can answer or we can either answer them on screen or um, on chat. So uh, please don't hesitate to interact with us because again, this is live. So without further ado, uh, Brian, you have the floor. All right, well, I'm gonna go share um, my screen here. And I'm going to start by basically going to the website on GitHub that has our library. And uh, you should be seeing now the uh, the page for the library. Uh, all of our libraries are hosted under the Redis uh, user uh, in GitHub. And the one that I'm talking about today, it's Redis on Spring. And it is, uh, let me scroll down a little bit here. We got our nice uh, funky logo. And we are billing it as object mapping uh, and more for Redis. And this particular library extends uh, Spring Data Redis. The Spring Data Redis uh, project, it's an amazing project that does a lot of stuff uh, between Spring and Redis. Um, and it, it focuses mostly on uh, what we call OSS Redis. And there is this gigantic ecosystem of modules that add a lot of functionality to Redis. And as a company, we wanted to basically bring that also uh, in an easy to use uh, fashion to our users. So uh, Redis on Spring extends uh, Spring Data Redis, and it gives you uh, a, a few extras that I think you're going to find interesting. So um, let me actually build an application from the ground up, and hopefully I have enough time for this. But if you're a Spring developer, uh, you're very familiar with the Spring Initializer. It's a website that basically gives you the ability to uh, create a brand new skeleton application. And in here, I have the uh, page open to the defaults. Uh, you get your uh, com example demo application. Uh, it's going to be a jar, uh, Java 11, and then we're going to add a few dependencies. And in here, I'm going to add a web because we're going to make it a, a little uh, web service. And uh, we're going to add the, the dev tools. That's always uh, a must have. And I'm going to add a long book because I don't like to type too much. That basically gives you the ability to auto generate getters and setters and constructors and you know, builder factories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so with those uh, three dependencies in place, now I can click on uh, generate. And this is going to basically download um, a zip file that has my project. So I'm going to switch now to, uh, let me switch now to the command line. And I'm doing a little bit of a two-step dance here, switching between uh, windows. Uh, I, I will get better at this. Uh, so I'm going to now copy that that um, zip file to the current directory that I'm working on. I think it should be called demo.zip. And I'm going to move that to the current directory. I'm going to go ahead and unzip it. And, um, and now I'm going to switch to that directory. Switch to that directory now, and you should see oh, not, not KS LS. You should see a regular um, Spring Boot project, and I'm going to do a git in it because I'm going to use uh, the uh, import uh, feature to basically bring it into um, and let's bring it name the main branch to main because we don't use master anymore. All right. So now uh, with that in place, what I'm going to do it's bring it into STS, which is uh, the Spring Project Eclipse version, uh, so we can actually work with the application. So let me go ahead and uh, find my STS window. All right. OK, so now you should be seeing my Eclipse STS window. And what I'm going to do next is to, and I believe you can see my um, my menu, but that's okay. I'm doing a file import, and I'm gonna say projects from Git in an existing local repository. That's why I did the Git in it because it makes it easier to actually import. Um, and let me just find that. You can't see that because that's on a window that will teach me not to use separate windows for demoing. Um, but you should see the results in a second. So I'm importing that project and it should be coming in 
right about now. Okay, so we have our project uh, called Demo. And uh, as you can see, it's a Spring Boot uh, application. And to use a uh, uh, Redis Ohm Spring, the first thing we need to do is uh, since we are on a snapshot release, I need to add a repositories uh, chunk to the POM file, to the Maven POM file. So I'm going to, uh, right here under the properties, I'm going to add this repositories. This is the snapshots uh, repo uh, from Sonotype, uh, which is basically the maintainers of the Maven Central. And with that in place, we can also now add the dependency. And under dependencies, I'm gonna put it right here under the Spring Boot starter web. And I'm gonna go in, let me go ahead and uh, format this so everything looks nice. And in here we have the dependency that brings in the library. So that's the uh, uh, com Redis own package, uh, the group ID. In the artifact, it's Redis own spring. And we, uh, you can see we're at a very early stage in the development of the library. We have, we're at 0, 0 0.1.0 snapshot uh, edition. All right, so with that in place, um, we can now, let's just do a Maven uh, update the project. And as I update the project, I should uh, pull down those dependencies from Maven Center. All right, so what are we gonna do with this? First, now, now that we have our POM uh, configured to basically run the uh, Spring Boot application with Spring, um, with Redis Ohm Spring, I'm going to add a model. So under my uh, COM example demo, I'm going to add a new class. And my new class, just, just call it company. It's gonna be a company and uh, let's put it in a models package. So we have our company in our models package. And we have the skeleton there and I have prepared some um, skeleton code. So typically you would start your development with something like this. So we have a very simple class in here. Uh, since we're going to be use, using Lombok, I don't have getters and setters in here. We're going to basically add some annotations to deal with that. But I wanted to show you the uh, company uh, Pojo here. So we have an ID. Uh, in most uh, Spring um, applications, you would have some field that denotes the uh, primary key of the object. And then we have a company name. We had a set of tags. Uh, a URL for the company, a location, which is a point class. That's a Spring Framework a geo point class. Uh, and I have a couple integers for the number of employees, the year founded, and then a Boolean that tells us whether the company is publicly listed or not. So that would be uh, the, the basic skeleton for a POJO. So now let's decorate that with something that's gonna make it uh, a little different. So uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is gonna put some annotations at the class level here. And uh, let me bring in uh, all the imports that I need so we don't have to play around with hunting for imports. So uh, we start uh, with the data annotation. This is a Lombok annotation that allows me to basically get um, um, some facility methods uh, added to my POJO. And I have constructors, uh, require argument constructor, all arguments constructor, all that coming from Lombok. But then the star of the show, it's uh, the document annotation. And this is from uh, Redis Ohm Spring. The document annotation, the notes of this POJO is going to be persisted as a JSON document uh, in uh, Redis. Now, that by itself, uh, the document annotation will use a lot of defaults to figure out how to deal with the fields in here, but we can be pretty specific on how we want to deal with them. So let me go ahead and grab a little bit of a cheat sheet code that I have in here that has already annotations added to the fields. So you don't see me typing here for hours. And uh, what, what you see it on screen right now, let me uh, zoom this up. It's that I've added uh, the traditional ID annotation to my ID field. This comes from the Spring Framework. And then I have uh, non-nullable fields. Uh, those are uh, coming right from Lombok that basically you know, will prevent those uh, fields from being null in terms of the constructors and setters and all that stuff. And now we have a few annotations that come from Spring Redis OM. Uh, one, it's searchable. Searchable allows you to do a full text search 
over a field. So that means that on startup of the application, um, the library will scan these classes, uh, see that searchable annotation, and add a full text search index for the name field for that specific uh, company class. Uh, li uh, likewise, the index annotation allows you to do uh, exact match on keywords. So index uh, on this set of strings called tags will basically create an, an index that you're, uh, a secondary index that you can uh, search by the specific values uh, in, in that field. Uh, similarly, for a point type of class, uh, the index annotation now uh, understands it, it's uh, polymorphic in terms of, you know, polymorphic behavior, it knows that this is a geo uh, class, it will create a geo index in, or a geo field in your index to deal with uh, uh, geo locations. Uh, similarly for numbers, like we have here for the number of employees, we also have the index annotation, it will create a numeric index, uh, and same thing for the year founded. Oh, and I'm sorry, I accidentally uh, removed our publicly listed field, let me add it back in here. So then we have a POJO fully annotated to work with uh, Redis on Spring. Okay, good. But how do we get to do anything with this? So the uh, the first thing that we want to do is uh, create a repository. In Spring, repositories are interfaces that declare uh, the type of operations that you want to use with the data. And to use uh, the document uh, storage facilities of our library, you want to use a custom repository that we provide called the Redis document repository. So I'm going to go ahead in here and create a new class. And we're going to call it company, company repository. I always feel like typing suppository for some reason. So I don't know why that's the case. <laughs> and I'm going to put it in a repositories package. And this is not a class, this is going to be an interface. Uh, and I, I, well, I can always change that on the code. That's not a big deal. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, make that an interface. And um, what we want to do, let me put in some imports in here. I have prepared some of the imports that we need. And you can see that the last one in here, it's Redis document repository. And we're going to extend that uh, in our repository. And by just doing that, you have gained all the CRUD methods that your repository needs. So it, for those of you not familiar with the repository concept, it's like a DAO, uh, but rather working at the uh, storage uh, backend level, it works at the object level, collections, list, sets, things like that. So notice that I'm in here, I'm passing two uh, classes to the document repository types. And the first one, it's the type of object that you're basically persistent or uh, dealing with, in this case, company. And the second one is the type of the primary key. And if you remember, our company has a primary uh, string ID, and that class type should be here on the second um, element. So that's all you need. Just by declaring that interface, uh, your interface extending uh, Redis document repository, you get all the CRUD methods. So how do you go ahead and, and, and use this? So let's take a look at the application that gets created uh, by the uh, Spring Initializer. And you can see that it has the uh, Spring Boot Application annotation and simply has a bootstrapping run method. So we're going to uh, make a few changes to it. We're going to enhance it to basically be able to recognize our repositories, uh, scan for our classes, create indexes, and, uh, and um, enhance our classes with dynamic methods that can basically respond to our needs. So I'm going to, again, bring some imports in here because we don't want to see me typing those. Uh, all right, so I brought in a bunch of different imports in here. Let me make this bigger for you guys. And uh, as you can see, I added a uh, enable um, Redis document repositories. That should be added in addition. I don't know why I removed it to the Spring Boot application annotation. And notice that inside of enable Redis document repositories, we have the base packages that you want to scan for um, annotations related to the library. So I'm mean, here, I have my COM example demos. So that means it's going to go under the domains, repositories, uh, or models, uh, packages that I created. 
Okay, with that in place, now we need to pull in our repository. So I'm going to use the auto wire annotation here. And I'm going to declare a company repository. So Spring will basically, again, scan uh, the application, find uh, a company repository interface, and then implement all the real classes uh, uh, dynamically uh, uh, at, at boot time. So you can basically have a, an implementation of something that you just declare. So it's, it's declarative programming uh, without providing a single line of implementation. So OK, so we have a repository. How do we add some data to the application? So we can start seeing things. So I have a command line runner method uh, aptly named uh, load test data. And I just wrote that on screen. And as you can see, this uh, being annotated method called load test data, it's going to uh, first kill everything, uh, any company in the database uh, by using this delete all. This is coming from all the CRUD methods that you get for free from the repository. Uh, then I'm creating two companies. I'm creating uh, Redis and Microsoft. And uh, noticing here that I have a the long book provide constructors where I take the name of the company, the URL, and both of them have a geolocation uh, near or very close to their headquarters, and then a number of employees, I believe, and year established. And uh, I also have a set of tags for the, the two companies, so we can do some searches based on, on those tags. And finally, I use the repo to save the two objects to the database. You could also uh, use the save all and pass a collection or a list of those objects. So uh, and this is all from Spring uh, Data Redis. Uh, we basically build on top of that to, to have all those facilities available to us. So I'm going to go ahead and save that. And, and now that we have a, a model annotated, we have a repository, and we have a bootstrapping method that should basically uh, load data into the database, I'm going to uh, stop the screen share and now share the command line again so we can see some of that magic happening. All right, so uh, you should be seeing now my command line. Let me go ahead and... Uh, clear that screen so we move to the top all right so we have a traditional spring boot application on a different tab i have the redis cli or i did oh i'm going to have the redis cli here running in monitor mode that means that everything that every command that redis receives will basically see an echo for it here and if you look at on this other tab i have the redis cli and we can see what keys we have so we have nothing in the database um, again, uh, probably all of the dev advocates at Redis will tell you don't use the keys command on a real database. This is okay for development purposes, but uh, for a live database that can have you know, billions of keys, this would be a very bad idea because it would be a blocking command. All right, so now that we have our application, uh, here we're in the application uh, folder, I'm going to uh, use the Maven uh, built-in runner to uh, Use uh, run the Spring Boot uh, goal run uh, to run the application. So I'm going to that's going to compile and run the application, and I'm going to switch to the Redis CLI here, um, so we can see the data being inserted into the into the database. And as you can see in here, uh, Redis uh, scan uh, uh, Redis own Spring scan the packages found the annotated uh, models, and then use the uh, FD create to create indexes for our application objects. So for our company class, we have a company index. Uh, it's a JSON specific index, and you can see that it knows the prefix of our objects and the schema uh, appropriately created the fields in the index based on the type of the Java objects. Uh, and you can see here down below where we basically do a JSON set. Uh, that's where it's saving the JSON document into the database, a serialized JSON document from the Java objects. Um, and then it does the, uh, the second one. And if we go to the Redis CLI, if we do the keys command again, we can see that we have uh, three keys in here. The first one, it's a set that Spring Data Redis traditionally uses um, to keep the uh, the primary keys of the class. So if I do an S members, you can see that I have the two uh, ULITs 
Uh, here's uh, that ULIT that uh, Simon was talking about. Uh, we're using uh, what we call a better UUID. Uh, it's easier to read. Uh, it's uh, much more random than the uh, the general uh, UUIDs, and uh, and you can do you can order them and do a lot of interesting math uh, set uh, operations with them. So we have that set of primary keys, and we can also take a look at one of our documents. So I can do a JSON GET uh, for one of the other full uh, company objects. So you can see that there's the class prefix, uh, then there's a column in the ULIT after that. And if I do that, you can see uh, the JSON that's backing that specific class, uh, that specific document. All right, so with that in place, let me uh, switch back to the code. Hopefully I'm not eating too much time here. Um, okay, so back to our Eclipse uh, STS IDE. Now uh, we have a model, we have a uh, repository, we have a way to bootstrap data into the database. Now let's actually add some specific queries that can do something interesting with our uh, repository. So we had the empty repository here. And what I'm going to do next, it's I'm going to in bulk at all the queries that I wanted to show you. And, uh, and we'll talk about them. Uh, we'll talk about a few of them, depending on how we're doing on time. But let me uh, first highlight what we have in here. And before we do this, I'm going to, uh, once again, flush uh, the database so I can do this all over again. And, All right, so the, near the top, now the way that a repository works in Spring is that you also don't have to provide code to back the methods. You just have to declare the methods and follow the conventions and the library will generate the required uh, queries against uh, Redis uh, using the search engine, Redis search and uh, Redis native commands to basically achieve whatever goal you're, you're uh, declaring in the method names. So notice in the first one, I have one to find one element by property. Uh, it returns an optional of a company uh, by using this find one by name. Uh, first of all, the find one tells the underlying engine that, hey, let's narrow the list of objects to one. Uh, I think by default, it will grab the first one if there's multiple ones coming back, or I don't remember if it throws an exception. But um, And notice that when you say by name, now the it knows that this name uh, attribute being passed to the method will be injected into the query as the name property of the company object. So if you're familiar with Spring, this is all, all news. Uh, and uh, similarly, we can do uh, geospatial queries by doing find by location near, so the keyword near, uh, and just the type of the location field of company will basically uh, tell our query engine that, yes, uh, first of all, this should take a point in a distance uh, to query, and we're going to return a collection of those companies uh, back. Uh, also, if you run into a specific case where the dynamic query generation doesn't do what you need, you can also uh, pass a literal query. Uh, uh, this is a literal uh, ready search query. And uh, this dollar tax will basically be the value of the tax property here in the attributes of the, uh, of the method. Uh, and you can, again, get as as low level as needed, or be completely high level and just let Spring and uh, Redis own Spring generate the code for you uh, for free. Uh, notice we can do numeric property finders. We can do uh, property ranges too. For example, in here I have find uh, by the number of employees between two different numbers. And uh, you can also do strings uh, like basically find by name starting with a specific prefix. All right, so with that in place, let's also add a controller so we can actually hit this from um, from the uh, from a HTTP client. So let's let me go ahead in here and create a new class. So let me create a new class, and we're going to call this company controller, and it's going to be under the controllers package, appropriately named. 
So now uh, you should see a company's controller in there, and this is going to be just our generic uh, REST controller for um, Spring. So I'm going to add all the uh, imports that we need. There's the REST controller annotation. Let me make this a little bigger. Uh, then we have a request mapping. It's going to go against, um, uh, we're going to route the service at API companies. And then inside of the body of our controller, I'm going to copy and paste a massive amount of methods to basically mirror those uh, queries that we have in um, the repository. So as you can see, I have uh, now using the repository, just like we did in the bootstrapping class, I'm auto-wiring the repository into my controller. And um, if you wanted to do something more complex, you would have a service here that uses the repository to compose things uh, probably across multiple repositories. Uh, and then we have some getters, um, some basically uh, HTTP get uh, endpoints uh, to basically find, you know, companies by number of employees, uh, by number of employees in a range. And you can see that I'm piping through the to the repository uh, specific methods uh, underneath. All right, so uh, let me uh, just do a quick uh, scan of this. Uh, get all the, uh, obviously you can also use uh, query methods that you didn't declare, the ones that are basically built in as part of the CRUD uh, interfaces in the repository. So find all, for example, I can get all by IDs. Um, uh, sorry, I can get all the IDs of the uh, the objects in the database and make that a pageable list. And uh, here's the um, probably more interesting query here, the location near. You can see that we're passing a lat along and a distance as doubles. And then we build those uh, and pass them to the find location near uh, method that we created in our repository. So that's all uh, good and dandy. So let's save that. Let me go ahead and restart the, uh, the application. And then I'm going to switch on final time to, I'm gonna switch now to using uh, Postman. Couldn't remember the name of Postman. Um, and I have some queries already prepared in here to show you. So uh, you should be seeing my Postman um, screen right now. And uh, here is one of the queries that we basically have in here. This is the, the find all companies. So we only have two, so it's a pageable query, but uh, as you can see, we get our results back as a nice uh, XML payload. Uh, and then you have all the paging um, meta information. And now let's see, for example, a company by name. I'm happy to be passing the name that I'm looking for as part of the URL, probably not a great um, practice, but that's what I did. And you can see here that we get our Redis uh, document from the database, uh, where our ULID, the name of the company, the set of tags uh, in Spring, uh, uh, Redis Ohm Spring basically does all this munging back and forth of uh, Java, uh, 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 JSON, and uh, whatever the Redis uh, native formats happen to be. Uh, also, all the translation between specific Spring classes in the Java uh, and Redis classes happen automatically. Here is our name starts with a method that created in the, in the repo. And you can see we, we pass RE, we get Redis back. Uh, and the uh, the fun query, the geolocation query, uh, we're passing a lat and long. I think this is a, a park near near the uh, Redis headquarters. And uh, I did a 30 uh, mile radius. It's miles were hard coded in this specific one. And we basically get the, query, the Redis headquarters back. Um, then uh, again, we can find things by tag. So any of the companies where the tag reliable was part of the uh, tags. And you can see in here that we got that, that is a tag in common between the two companies that we created in the database. And finally, uh, we have the uh, number of employees uh, by count. And uh, you can see here that I used an exact search for that one. So uh, that's basically one one part of what Spring, uh, what Redis Home Spring can do. Uh, we also have enhancement over the typical hash 
base uh, storage. Uh, and we have some other fun things too that we will show later, uh, like uh, the uh, probabilistic data structure methods that allow you to do things in a much more efficient space, efficient and time efficient uh, fashion. But that, that's all I have for you guys. And I think I'm almost, out of, yeah, I'm definitely out of time. Um, and come check it out. The library, it's uh, in active development. Uh, I am looking for helpers, contributors, ideas. Um, right now, it's basically been a, a, a one-man passion project, but I'm really looking for uh, contribution from the community and to make this uh, uh, a strong candidate out there for all of our Redis users. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. Once again, you do that magical art of making Java, which is something mystical to me, <laughs> very understandable and accessible. So I'm really looking forward to uh, working. Now, the tutorial that you actually ran through, is that is that what's on the GitHub Redis um, Spring right now? Yes. Yes, okay. it is. Yeah, there's there's two demo applications as part of the repo. Uh, one is this exact document uh, um, demo, and the other one it's the hash based demo. Awesome. And awesome. Uh, in I'm, I'm working on a, a bigger, more encompassing demo with like you know a beautiful UI and all that. But I love. I'll it. be coming down the pipe. Uh, maybe I'll set up this live uh, a live session where I actually run through the tutorial and maybe have you go over my shoulder to. Uh to sort of help me through that. Yeah, that'll the be great. That'll be great. Yeah, because yeah, uh, you, you definitely need, I definitely need a, a, a more than a second pair of eyes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Um, on to something that I actually have very dear and near to my heart, Node.js. And with Node.js, uh, with Ohm, we have the uh, illustrious, and oh, what did you what did you call yourself, Guy? Um, it was, um, what was it? Um... Thoroughly, uh, thoroughly tolerable. tolerable. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Uh, you're much, much more than tolerable, friend. Yeah. Uh, All right. Well, um, we have Guy with Redis Ohm for Node.js, and I will shrink off into the background. Okay. Well, I was going to lead with a joke about hi, I'm uh, Justin Castilla. Since he led with a joke of him not being me, I could lead with a joke of uh, me not being him. Uh, but the stress and strain of hosting uh, Redis Monthly Live is so much. Uh, that uh, he's gone gray in a matter of minutes. But on the plus side, much of his hair has grown back. <laughs> Sorry, Justin, didn't mean to make fun of that particular aspect. It just came out. Uh, <laughs> um, anyhow, so welcome. Uh, I did the uh, Redis Ohm for Node.js, uh, or for Node. Uh, the proper, uh, if you go out to the style dictionary or the style guidelines for Node, they say that it's always spelled Node.js, but even if it's sp spelled Node.js, you just say Node. So oh, this is Redis Ohm for Node. Uh, so uh, this is a, uh, like Brian said, uh, this is a passion project that I, I've spent a couple months of my life uh, putting together. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh, how to build a really simple, uh, just like a single file application. Uh, you know, this little script that just hits Node and, you know, hit, hits Redis and using Redis Ohm and, and um, saves some stuff out there and reads it and, and searches and stuff like that. And... Um, and because I'm me, um, I'm going to go with a, a fun and ridiculous theme. And so uh, I've had this idea for a long time with a buddy of mine named Kelly of building a, a website for developer relations purposes called uh, paranormal.dev. And paranormal.dev is a, a site where uh, folks can you know, call in on a hotline or leave a message or send an email and you know, all these channels coming in to talk about uh, and, and report uh, you know, paranormal phenomena. Uh, you know, like goat sightings and Bigfoot sightings, and if they seen a UFO or, uh, you know, a chupacabra or something like that. And um, so uh, that's my little sample problem. I, I'm going to build a little application using Redisome that allows you to create, read, update, and delete things for paranormal.dev. And the idea here is, is that, uh, you know, maybe you're an investigator for paranormal.dev and, and you, you know, you need to go in and read these records and then figure out which ones to investigate and then which ones, you know, and then update them with follow-up data. So, so that's my fun and ridiculous example. <laughs> so uh, let's, uh, let's get writing some code here. So first things first, before we do anything, I need to install Redis, uh, Redis Ohm. So npm install dash dash save Redis Ohm. And that is all that is required to add Redis Ohm to a, uh, uh, a existing uh, node project. I've, you see here now we've got a package JSON and it's got Redis Ohm there, version 0 0.1.4, uh, which I just released Friday. Uh, you can see we got a, a nice big package, JSON, uh, dot, uh, package lock that got created. All right, so 
And we can even see that my GitHub status here changed. So uh, ohm is installed. Let's go ahead and uh, do our basic imports. There are, th I was going to say three, but there are four classes or uh, types that you really tend to care about a lot when you're dealing with Redis Ohm. You've got your client. Uh, this is the thing that knows how to talk to Redis. It uh, uh, encapsulates our Redis connection. You can pass it in to other things so that you can share that client between them. You've got your entity. Uh, these are the things that we're creating, reading, updating, and deleting, and searching for in Redis. So uh, in our case, our entity is going to be a citing. Uh, and so you would just extend the entity class uh, with your own custom type. You've got a schema here, which is uh, in, in the wrong order of, that I want to talk about here. But a schema is uh, it contains all the instructions on how to convert from entities to Redis types and Redis types to entities. Uh, it, it knows whether we're going to JSON or um, hash. It knows that this field is a string. It knows that this field is a number. This is a, t a string that's full text searched. It knows if you've been naughty or nice, all of those things. It's, it's a veritable Santa Claus of, um, uh, of, of a class. And then uh, last, but certainly not least, is the repository. Uh, the repository, uh, pronounced correctly here, uh, is um, the thing that you call create and read and update and delete against and that you call search against. So it's uh, you create a repository for a particular schema. Yeah. So those are the four things that we deal with in, uh, in Redis Ohm. Uh, clients are pretty easy. Let client equal new client. Very complicated code. And then uh, you pass into the client uh, the connection string for Redis. If you don't give it one, it uses localhost uh, 6379, which is the default for Redis. I'm going to go ahead and type in the default here. Localhost colon 6379. And that creates us a client. Once we have a client, we need to open it. Our client is open. Um, Clients are, like I said, they're how to talk to Redis. Uh, Redis Ohm it uses this mostly internally to uh, uh, serialize and deserialize your, your structures to Redis. Uh, but you can issue basic commands to it in case you need to do something a little more than just um, you know basic uh, uh, things that Redis Ohm can do. So for example, I can say uh, let pong equal await uh, client.execute and then pass in an array of discrete arguments, ping, and then if I console.log on, and then we run this, we can see that it actually does talk to Redis. So let's do an npm start, and we see it, it says pong. Now, it doesn't stop here. It just hangs, and that's because we haven't closed our uh, connection yet. So let's go ahead and close it, client.close. If you don't close the connection, Redis assumes that there might be more going on in Redis Ohm. And uh, node Redis underneath it uh, assumes that as well. So we run that again. Okay, now it's stopping, right? So all this is done is issued a ping here uh, and then a pong. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and replace this ping pong with a flush all because I want to wipe my database clean between these runs uh, because I'm going to run this multiple times and it'll keep adding and adding and adding and it'll accumulate. So let's just start with a clean slate each time. So PM start. Now it's we've got a, a clean Redis instance. So uh, once we have our client, uh, we would want to define an entity. Um, the simplest entity, I'm going to copy and paste from my cheaty code here, is um, that. So we've got a class citing. This would be, say, like maybe a Bigfoot citing. Uh, and it extends entity. And then it's just empty. And uh, you can add uh, custom messages in here if you like um, and, and custom properties. And, and I'll touch on that in a little bit, but just not yet. Uh, the simplest entity is just a single one line. Hey, this citing extends entity. Once we have that, we've got a client and an entity. Uh, we can create our schema. So for a schema, we'll say let schema equal new schema. And the schema class takes two arguments in its constructor. One is the entity citing. So this is the class that we define up here being passed into the schema. Uh, and what it'll do is it will uh, then modify, uh, uh, the, the schema class will modify the entity class to add properties to it. And it does that based on instructions you've given. So you can give it various uh, fields uh, here in this object here. So we've got a little JavaScript object here. And so one of the things we're gonna do is a date. We wanna, wanna have a field called date. And that ty the type of that field is a number. 
Now our schema has a number on it, a date. And so it will uh, add a number property getter and a setter uh, to the citing class so that when you instantiate it, you'll have access to them. Or so when Redis Ohm instantiates it, to be more, more precise. Uh, you can do numbers. Uh, you can do strings. So here uh, we've got a couple of varieties of strings. I'm actually going to paste several of these over here from my cheaty code. Right there and there. So here we've got, I need a comma. Uh, um, we've got one with full text search on here set to true and one without full text search. Now these are both strings, but they're going to behave differently. A uh, string with text search set to true uh, is going to allow you to do, uh, well, we've talked about this in some of the other examples. Uh, you know, if you've got, you know, a big description like uh, the title or the description of a, uh, a paranormal encounter. You know, this title might be, uh, you know, I saw Bigfoot out by the Walmart. And then uh, the description is, you know, he was out, uh, out back behind the Walmart. You know, he was eight feet tall, covered in brown hair. Um, if I'd been in Texas, I would have thought it was a skunk ape, right? Um, and uh, so with the full text search, we could say Bigfoot or skunk ape, and then it would match those things. Uh, whereas if you define a string with like here, county and state, which is where this sighting might have occurred, like, uh, you know, in uh, Franklin uh, County, Kentucky, um, then those match the entire thing. They don't match just a, a subset of the string. They match the entire string, which makes sense, right? I, I want to find this county. I don't want to find counties that have the word Franklin in them. I want to find Franklin County. Uh, and the same thing for state. I don't want to find... Uh, states that have the word Kentucky in them. I don't want to search for Carolina and get both North and South Carolina. I want to search for North Carolina. So the, these do a, a precise match, whereas these do a, uh, a full text search. So we've got numbers, we've got strings. We can also do uh, Booleans. And so here we've got a Boolean. Uh, here we're saying whether this uh, sighting has been investigated by someone from paranormal.dev yet. Uh, and so true or false, right? And uh, last but certainly not least, um, we have arrays. And for uh, Redis Ohm for a node, an array is always an array of strings. Actually, uh, inside of Redis, um, if you're using hashes, this is uh, a pipe delimited array of strings that, that we can then search within. Uh, if you're using Redis JSON, uh, which I recommend, uh, it actually represents it as an array of strings inside the JSON document. So, um, and so we, you know, you can search on those as well. It's an array of strings. Sometimes you have an array. So um, you know, let's schema, let's see, where are we at here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then uh, I, I mentioned hashes and JSON. So uh, by default, if uh, you just define this schema, this will serialize to hashes in Redis. It'll be a Redis hash. However, um, you can override that by setting the data structure. And you can specify hash or JSON. Hash is the default. So if you don't specify anything, you get hash. I'm going to use JSON. And I think that's the better way to go. Um, because it, 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 it's more semantic. It, it maps to the thing that we are actually talking about. So my number here, the date uh, in a JSON document is actually going to be stored as a number, not as a string that contains a number. Uh, the, uh, the Boolean is actually going to be stored as a true or a false in that JSON document. It's not going to be stored as a string containing true or false. Um, and the, the, the array is going to be an array of, uh, strings, not just a pipe delimited set of strings. And so, uh, the, the, this is more, uh, more true to form. And so that's why I prefer it. Um, so that is our schema definition. That's, that was a lot, wasn't it? Um, so once we have a schema, we've, we've got, uh, so far we've got our, our client, we've got our entity, we've got a schema, and now we need to create a repository. And there's two ways to do that. And uh, I'm going to do it uh, the fetch way. I can say let repository equals client.fetch repository, and then pass in that schema. And this will create a repository for that schema specifically. And so if you, um, in our case, it would be a sightings repository. Uh, you could create another schema and then give it another repository and use the same client and create another repository for a different schema. So the client gets reused across all the repositories. Um, and then once we have a repository, we can start doing things with it. So um, first things first of that is uh, let's create an entity and save it out to Redis. So to create an entity, we say let citing equal repository dot create entity. And what this will do, we'll create an empty entity with a with an ID populated. 
So it'll have a ULID. And uh, and that's it. And it won't save it out to Redis or anything. It's just it's just creating one for us to start using. And so if I uh, say, you know, console.log citing dots, um, we can actually get the entity ID right there, entity ID. If I run this code, see it spits out the entity ID. This is a ULID like we've seen in the other demos. So um, I don't want to uh, just log that out necessarily. I want to save this thing. So I'm going to put in my uh, my sighting information. And this sighting is um, a UFO sighting. So here we set the date to uh, date.now. So it's the Unix timestamp date time. The title is UFO from the trailer window. And this is actually, this is actually a true story from my childhood. <laughs> so uh, I remember when I was a kid, I literally saw a UFO in my trailer when I was laying, I, went, I was in bed, I was looking out the window uh, out the side of our trailer. And I saw this, um, this like uh, disc in the air with a bunch of colored rectangular lights spinning around it. It totally was not the Goodyear blimp at night. I'm sure it wasn't the Goodyear blimp because that would never happen where I lived and grew up in Medina, Ohio. But um, it is actually a thing that I saw. Um, I'm convinced it was the Goodyear blimp. But I saw a UFO in my trailer when I was a kid in the 80s. Uh, so the title is UFO from the trailer window. That that happened in Medina County, Ohio. Uh, I have reported this to the uh, paranormal.dev. Uh, they have not investigated it yet. So we've set that to false. And we've given it a couple of tags. Uh, it's a UFO sighting as opposed to, say, a ghost sighting. And it's a uh, child witness because I was 10 at the time. Um, so, yeah, that uh, creates uh, populates that entity. To actually save it, we need to call repository.save. So right there, we call repository.save, pass in that sighting right there. And this will return the ID as a, as a convenience. Um, so that you can go look for it afterwards. So I'm going to go ahead and log that ID, ID out. And we're going to run this again. And you have an ID. Now that we've run this and actually saved it, we can go look in Redis and see what it looks like when we take one of these uh, JSON objects and serialize it to Redis. So if I go out here to uh, uh, Redis, um, uh, Redis Insight here, this is the new preview 2.0 Redis Insight. Refresh my list of keys. We see we've got a JSON uh, uh, key here. It's citing colon and then that ULID. You might, might have noticed over here the ULID ended in uh, 25AA. And here we've got one in 25AA. Uh, that citing is the class name. So if uh, of our of this right here, this is that name right there. Uh, we we interrogate the uh, the constructor to figure it out. If you want to override it, you could actually say uh, prefix and then you could change it to be like, you know, um, foo. And then it would use foo instead, but we don't want to do that. Uh, I, I, I like that it says citing. I think it's funny. <laughs> and if we uh, look at this, uh, we'll see that there is indeed a JSON object in here. So here's our date, and it's a number. Uh, here's our title and our description, which are certainly strings, and the county and state are strings as well. Investigated is a, is a Boolean here. And if we expand the tags out, we'll see that it's actually an array with two elements in it, UFO and child witness. So cool. It worked. Um, let's do some more with it, right? So uh, we, we, we've created a thing and uh, we've saved it off. Uh, let's go ahead and fetch it. Uh, to fetch, you just say repository.fetch. So I'm going to paste some cheaty code in here so you can see that. So let fetched equals await repository.fetch. And then you just pass in the ULID, right? Uh, I created the thing. I know it's UUID. It's ULID. I, I have that ULID. I can pass it in and fetch it by it. And um, if I run this, this is going to have a small error in here, but we'll get to that. Um, it'll go out and fetch that and spit out its date as ISO, which doesn't exist. It's undefined on the object. The date is a number, whether it's been investigated or not, and our tags. And so we can see here, there's our number, there's our title, there's our Boolean, and here's our array. So this date as ISO is um, sort of a missing little bit here. Uh, it, I didn't define this on the schema, so it, it doesn't exist. But what I can do, and this is what I think is really cool, is I can add a function up here called date as ISO to the entity. And then that can refer to uh, things that are already on Redis uh, that the schema created. So here I say get date as ISO. And all it does is return a new date. And then it looks at this dot date. This dot date corresponds to this 13, this line 13 here where we've defined a date field. And then we just convert it to an ISO string. So now that I've added that, I've sort of created like business logic embedded into this entity, or I've created a, 
a computed field. And, and you could use this for business logic and, and computed fields. And you can even reference other repositories and use this to drill down through data. So like, you know, get all the, you know, you know, sightings might be associated with um, some other entity in your, your schema. And so you could just say, you know, you have a repository for that entity as well, and then drill around and search around and stuff. So you can get real very sophisticated with these. Um, but uh, since I've added that little computed field now, and if I run this again, we can see that we're getting a nice ISO date out of that. Uh, very precise. That's a little more than a date. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we can create a thing. We can fetch a thing. Uh, but fetching actually isn't what you usually need to do. You usually need to search. And so in order to search, um, we need to, well, we can... We, we need to use the repository search command. But before we can do that, we need to uh, tell the repository to create the index. So up here, after I've created the repository, I'm gonna add a call to repository.createIndex. That'll tell Redis search, hey, uh, index this, uh, create an index for all these um, uh, entities that the repository encapsulates and use all that schema information to do that. So, you know, hey, the, the date is a number, uh, the description is using full text, whereas the county is not. It, it conveys all that to Redis search and then allows us to do some search commands. And let's look at what those search commands could be like. So um, we're going to call, and I'm going to type this out because I think this is, I think this is just a little cooler typed out. We say repository dot search, and that gives us a um, a search object, and we can say dot where field name date. And then we get a whole bunch of functions on what, how we can look for date, right? And we want to say uh, is greater than, and we got we got a lot of semantic options here. We can say is greater than, we can say just uh, greater than if, if you're if you're more into doing things that way. Uh, we can just use, you know, whatever. I, I like them to read like sentences, so I'm going to do is greater than. And then I'm, I'm going to copy um, this little formula here. Uh, from my cheaty code it is greater than the current moment minus 24 hours. So this will get me uh, any uh, sighting that's occurred within the last 24 hours. Uh, and for the title matches, and this will do a full text search, trailer. So any, uh, any, any uh, sighting that is uh, within the last 24 hours that's in a that has the word trailer in the title, and state equals Ohio. So this is going to be a complete match. It's an all or nothing. It's not things that contain Ohio. This is just has the value of Ohio. And investigated. is false. I want things I haven't investigated yet. And, and you can put or in here, of course, and you can nest these. Uh, and the tags, this is sort of like a tag cloud of this is a UFO sighting, this is a Bigfoot sighting, just sort of arbitrary data, uh, where tags contain, contains, or contain, does the same thing, UFO. So this will give me, within the last 24 hours, where the titles trailer in the state of Ohio that I haven't investigated yet that are about UFOs. Very precise. And then once we've done that, we can call it just return all. And that will return all of them. Uh, now we've only put one thing in our database. So we're just gonna look at the first one. Uh, this is gonna return an array of those things. I'm gonna destructure that array and just get the first element of that array there. And uh, that um, should uh, find the one thing I've added. So let's let's copy over a little bit more of my cheaty code right here. There we go. And now we'll just uh, log that out. We'll log out what it found. So when I run this, um, let me widen this just a smidge so you can see it all. There we go. Uh, the ID is is that there. Uh, here is the thing that we fetched by ID. Here is the uh, same entity that we found using uh, Redis search. Uh, now that we've found it, we probably need to update it. So, uh, you know, in, in the course of investigating this uh, particular UFO sighting, 
uh, we found out, and you know, A, we've investigated it, so mark that as true. And B, uh, we realized that in, in addition to being a UFO sighting and being uh, a uh, child witness, uh, it's it was a close encounter of the first kind as opposed to the second or third kind. So we're not in Steven Spielberg territory here or anything. Um, and so we went ahead and added to the tags so that it is a first kind. And then uh, we can just call save again. Uh, just like we did before when we created it and saved it, this is exactly the same command. It works exactly the same way. So we just say save, and that will update anything we've had. And it, it will, again, return our ID of the thing that we saved. And we could, you know, spit out the found ID here. So we can run this and have it look all pretty. And um, there we go. So now it's there's our ID of the thing that we added. Here's uh, what we fetched by that ID. Here's what we found by searching. Here's the ID of the thing that was found. And because there's only one thing in our database, obviously it's it's finding that one thing. <laughs> and uh, the only command really left to, to show off here is um, to uh, to to do the uh, thing that all good UFO investigators do, uh, because I've seen Men in Black and I know how this works, which is to wipe any trace from your memory that this ever existed. So uh, let's go ahead and call repository.remove uh, that found entity. Uh, that would actually just be found. You just do the found ID there. Now uh, we'll run the script and. We've uh, found the uh, UFO sighting, we've investigated it, and then we've uh, blanked their memory. So and if we got and look in Redis, we can see that it is indeed quite empty now. So, um, so that's pretty much what I've got here. Uh, if you want to check this out, uh, we got uh, uh, we got Redis Ohm node here. Hang on. My screen went away. It got taken over by uh, Steve Lorello. <laughs> so... Um, if we, uh, if, if you want to go check out Redis Ohm, uh, of course, if you're using uh, uh, npm, you can just npm install Redis Ohm. Uh, but out here on GitHub.com/slash Redis/slash Redis Ohm node uh, is uh, the documentation and, and everything. I, I, I do want to point out something I think is kind of funny, which is that hey, look, we're live. <laughs> uh, I can put the little shield up there. Um, but yeah, go check it out and uh, looking for pull requests and feedback and everything. And um, yeah. Um, Thanks a lot. Uh, I saw a question here too. Uh, what's that cool UI tool to check the Redis state? That right here, this question right here, uh, Mikhail, that is Redis Insight. Uh, do, do we have a Redis Insight logo? Uh, uh, a banner that we can show up here? I, th I think we do. Uh, if not, it's, it's called Redis Insight. <laughs> that's, the, that's the skinny of it. I don't, I don't have a link handy, so. Um, but if you, if you go out to look for Redis Insight, you'll find it. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, it is fantastic. Isn't it? It's, it just makes it look so pretty. So. Sorry. I was trying to find that Redis Insight banner, but I'll, uh, add that a little bit. <laughs> and, and, and I, I can't help but show anything that is complimentary of my work. Uh, <laughs> so thank you, Jeremiah. That's very kind. Um, and I was, that's exactly what I was trying to do when I, I created that insect syntax was to get it to read like plain English. Um, that, that was specifically my goal. That, so, uh, thank you for that validation. It's much appreciated. I would recommend anybody, uh, who's interested in, uh, the Node.js Redis Ohm client library to go through the readme because the actual list of, uh, semantic use cases, uh, that a guy has created for Redis Ohm is staggering. It's beautiful. And uh, I've had the. Uh, I'll bring them up here. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is finding albums. And so, you know, you can wait where year not equal is equal. And um, I've just created a whole bunch of semantic words to make it be more like a sentence. That's That was my entire intention. So, lovingly handmade by Guy Royce himself. Spoke. <laughs> <laughs> no, that looks great. Cool. Thank you very much, Guy. Thanks. See you later. All right. See ya. So um, moving along, we have, um, last but not least, the director of .NET, the Kaiser of Top K, the prince of probabilistic data structures, the baron of bloom filters. I give you Steve. I think those are probably some hyperbolic uh, <laughs> titles, but I will go with it. All right. <laughs> Awesome. Well, <laughs> thank you very much for joining us again, Steve. And um, you might have seen Steve in our Dev Sember 
series. Uh, he helped us talk about some probabilistic data structures. And again, uh, you will see a lot of us in the uh, DevSember series talking about individually on our, the Redis Ohm clients again. So if you can't get enough, uh, make sure to tune into DevSember and you'll see even more. Cool. All right, Steve, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, I guess I will add my stream in here. And because I cannot tolerate to see myself even out of the corner of my eye when I'm presenting, I'm going to uh, minimize the screen. So um, I'm going to be talking about uh, redisohm.net, which if you want to check it out, is you can come check out GitHub. And we have a lot of resources in here, including a tutorial that this links to on our developer website. But anyway, redisome.net is similar to the other redisome clients that we've looked at in that it attempts to basically build object modeling and object mapping into Redis as well as providing capabilities like search and um, aggregation to uh, Redis clients that are using .NET. And because it's .NET, uh, the primary mode of interfacing and searching for things in Redis now is with Link. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started and I guess the way that's probably wisest to get started is actually to start up Redis. And for redisome.net and uh, pretty much the other Redis clients too, you're probably going to want to use one of the um, module Docker containers uh, when, you, uh, when you're when you just in development mode. So I'm going to go ahead and start up Docker with Docker run dash P6379 colon 6379. And I'm going to use the Redis labs slash Redis mod. And this is going to contain um, a bunch of the modules that we've talked about, including Redis Search and Redis JSON. And with those, you can actually get a lot of the uh, coolest features of Redis Home. So then I'll open up my command prompt and cd to uh, project slash Redis. And I'm just going to show everything off in sort of just a basic console app. So I'm going to do a .NET new console dash N uh, test Redis home. And then I'm going to CD into that project. And I am going to now actually add Redis home to um, this project. So if I just did a list in here, you would see that I have this CS project file and I just want to add the uh, project to that. So. I'll just do a .NET add package redis .ohm, and that's going to install everything that I need to get up and running with Redis Ohm. And I'm going to start here, open it in Rider, and while that's happening, I'm going to go over to my documents folder, and I have just a, a little JSON file that has a bunch of test objects that I'm going to be seeding into Redis. So if I open this up, when this finishes loading, which is now, I can go into my program.cs file and we see I have my blank hello world going on here. And if I go look at employees.json, you'll see I just have a bunch of employee objects in here. Uh, they have like things like first name and last name and their age and uh, what their sales were for the last year. And I have this little sales adjustment factor in here that's maybe based off of their region or their level of experience with the company, as well as their department name um, and their location. And for the most part in here, I have sales folks, but towards the end here, I also have a couple of engineering folks. So anyway, the first thing we're gonna actually do now is we are going to create an object that's going to represent an employee. So I'll create an employee class. And that employee class, is going to be annotated with a bunch of attributes. And the first attribute we need to use is actually use the document attribute. The document attribute is similar to the Redis Ohm Spring in that it represents an object that you want to store in Redis. And by default, it will use a hash. If you want to set it to JSON, you can just say storage type is JSON. And that's all you have to do. But anyway, let's go ahead and add these attributes in here. So prop, string, first name, prop, string, last name, prop, string, department name. I will do a prop 
int sales sales prop int age prop um and double uh, sales adjustment and with all of those set up now we can start doing things with them all right so the first thing i want to actually do is set up some way for me to query them and uh for me to aggregate them so to enable something as something you can query you have to either add the index attribute to it which is basically like oh this is something that i want to have a tag index for if it's a string or a numeric or geolock uh, index for if it's uh not a string so for first name and last name they're both going to be indexed for department name just for fun i'm going to mark this as searchable which means that you can do essentially full text search and then let me blow this up a little bit so folks can see a little better um for sales this is just going to be indexed age will be indexed and sales adjustment will be indexed and of course i forgot one attribute and that's the um geolock which is going to be location so this is like just a particular point a uh, lat launch point uh, that someone is located at and this is going to be indexed and because i'm also going to be doing aggregations with these i also want to mark all of these as either sortable or aggregatable it doesn't really matter which one you set so i'm just going to set them all to aggregatable so let me just copy this down here and There we go. Now everything is just set to aggregatable, so can I, I can actually use them in my aggregation pipelines. So the employee class is now created, so let's do stuff with it. We have declared an employee, employees, um, and we have at, decorated with a document so that we can store it in Redis, and we have decorated each of its properties with um, a different attribute to indicate whether it's um, it should be searchable or not. So now I'm going to go into my program.cs file. And the first thing I'm going to do is actually mark this employees.json file as something that I want to copy into um, the build directory. So I'll always copy that. And then the first thing I will actually do is pull in the JSON from that employees.json uh, file. So our employee JSON equals uh, file that read all text async and employees.json and I'll just await this and then I can just do a compile dot right line. Sorry to interrupt Steve. Can you make ahead. this one as well? Yes I can make this bigger. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> I have to remember every time. Um, and so if I do a .NET run now, can I make this bigger? Yes I can. It now actually prints out all that all that data in there. And so the obvious next step here is to actually marshal all this JSON data into um, a bunch of JSON objects. So I will do that. Um, employees from JSON equals JSON serializer dot uh, deserialize, and I'll store that in an, an employee array, employee JSON, and this is actually going to fail. So if I run this, it's actually going to break. And I knew it would break because this location here is stored as this just flat string of um, just like this. And I actually want to deserialize it um, using the JSON serializer or the, the geolock JSON serializer that is part of Redis Ohm. So I need to create a bunch of for, um, JSON our options equals new JSON serialization options. And to options, I'm going to add, add to converters uh, a new geolock JSON converter. And that's going to allow me to actually deserialize that nicely. So if I pass in options to my deserialization call here, I can just like start, no, I'll just do a for each. Or I can do a console dot right line. Um, I can just do an employee dot 
first name and employee dot last name. All right, so now I'm actually able to get all those JSON objects in here and be off to the races with them. So now let's actually do something in Redis. So to start working with Redis and Redis Home, you're going to create a new provider. So I'm going to create a new Redis connection provider by saying var provider equals new Redis connection provider and pass again Redis colon forward slash forward slash local host colon 6379. That URI right here will allow you to connect to Redis. And then, oops, sorry. And then I'm going to go through each of these employees and I'm actually going to add them to um, my Redis data uh, to my Redis database. So I actually want um, a few other objects from this provider. The first one, we'll, I'll call it employees and that's going to be provider.redis collection uh, employee. So I have this generically typed Redis collection that I'm going to pull out. And this is going to be essentially the central point for uh, all the queries that I'm going to issue from now on and all the insertions and stuff I'm going to do. So I'm going to say console.write line. I'll put some delimitation in here, um, inserting please. And I will go through this um, list of employees for each var employee and employees from Jason, not I am. And there we go. So for each one of those employees, I will take that employee and I will insert it into um, Redis. So inserting uh, that employee into Redis will create an ID for me that I can then use to actually query the employee directly. So I can say are also employee, and I can set that equal to await employees dot um, find by ID async ID, and then I can just do the same thing up here. I will say. This time, instead of being also employee, it will be also employee. And if I run that, it will have been inserted. And these are now employees that I've been pulling out of Redis um, that I've found by ID. They're marshaled into an employee object, and I just write them out. All right, so that's actually just inserting employees. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you is actually how to iterate over all of your employees. So if you wanted to, for some reason, iterate over all of your employees, um, you can do that. And to do that is actually quite simple. Um, you know, use an uh, asynchronous for each loop. And you'll just iterate over employees. So with that, I will just do a console.write line. Um, let's say employee dot first name employee dot last name is employee dot age years old and sold employee dot um, sales last year and if i do that it'll write that little sentence out for me for each of the employees except of course, I forgot to actually create the index, which was very foolish of me. Um, so let me go ahead and do that. So I'm actually going to flush the DB out so I don't get all these duplicates in here. And the last, the last thing I'm going to do every time is call provider dot connection dot execute async flush DB. Not something you probably want to do in a production database if you know your data, uh, but this is just to sort of reset everything every time. And after I get this provider object, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is call provider.connection.createIndex, and I'm going to pass in the type of uh, employee, and that will create the index from this employee object. 
And then I can actually start querying things uh, in Redis with that. So you see with that index created, I can now iterate over all of my employees and just print out stuff from them. You'll see that all the employees got printed out. And of course, uh, these two, uh, Mei Chen and uh, Laboria Kinsley, uh, they didn't sell anything last year because they're in engineering. So um, that's where that little discrepancy comes from. So say now we want to actually search for things, but not iterating over an entire set or um, just querying them by ID because it's not super useful. Say we want to find someone by their first name, okay? So we'll just find um, John here by his, first, by his first name. So to do that, if I want to find all the Johns um, that work for this company, I can just do it in FR, wait for each employee in employees, uh, where X dot me, uh, first name equals John. I'll just do, I'll add this delimination here. And I will just print out the same little string right here. So run, there's only one John that works at the company. Um, and so we just printed him out. So that's neat. Um, it's nice that you can actually just have this basic link syntax that you can use to actually query stuff. Uh, say now we wanted to find all the employees that are less than 36 years old, um, for example. And that should print out, I believe, three different uh, individuals. Um, we could just, instead of saying first name equals John, we would just say age is less than 36. So I would just say all employees less than 36 years old. And just run that and it will print out the, uh, I guess it's four employees that are less than 36 in our example here. Um, but basically my the point of this is to show you that um, you can create these different predicates in here. And if you wanna combine them, so if I wanted to say, do the same thing, but find all the employees that are 36 year, uh, less than 36 and whose name are Alice. I can do that too. So by just saying, and x dot first name equals Alice and about that. And that will create um, that query for me and it will query Redis and print everything out that I want. All right, so that is um, like, basically like matching and range queries and all that kind of stuff. Uh, another neat thing is if you wanted to do full text search, like um, I would think pretty much everyone else here has shown you before, department is marked as searchable. So I can actually search um, for employees by their department name essentially, and like components of their department. So you'll notice that in my employees.json here, uh, folks have, a region and a, a type. So like APAC sales or uh, North America engineering or North America sales. And we can use that now and say, um, say I want to find all the employees in North America, all employees in North America. And I just want to use that department field for that. That department name equals NA and maybe I'll just throw in and works in the uh, employee dot department name department. Like that, you'll see that I just queried that NA and it prints out all the folks whose uh, department name matched that NA. And if I want to find all the people in sales, likewise, I could just say, um, in sales and just say x dot department name equals sales. Now I just basically queried um, almost every employee because only two of the employees that I had in this JSON document were not in sales. All right, so that like shows you a lot of what you can do from 
searching perspective in uh, Reddit. So uh, you can do other things like uh, you can do order by, you can do, uh, you could essentially limit your queries um, by like a certain number if you want to with like skips and takes and stuff like that. But that's like essentially um, the basics for querying in with redisome.net. So the next thing to look at um, is actually something that I really like about Redis Own and um, Redis Search, and that is aggregations. So an aggregation is essentially um, a group of things that you run on the Redis server as like a pipeline of operations. And I'll show you sort of what I mean by that. So the first thing I need to do to actually run aggregations, well, the first thing I needed to do, I did, and I marked all of my fields essentially as aggregatable, which means that they can be loaded easily into the pipeline as I um, as I run stuff. But I want to create this employees employee aggregations object. And I will do that by calling the provider dot Redis no not Redis collection dot aggregation set and passing in the type employee. So this aggregation set now will allow me to operate on the different um, items in uh, what is it in Redis now that are marked as aggregatable. So say I have these two fields here. I have um, you know sales and sales adjustment. And those are basically two independent fields from each other, which when combined will produce a adjusted sales figure for that uh, sales representative. So say I wanted to calculate that for everybody. So I can do that by saying for each var aggregation in employee aggregations dot apply. This apply now allows me to actually perform functions in Redis with um, uh, with the um, data that I already have in there. So I can say x dot record shell dot um, sales times x dot record sale dot um, sales adjustment. And what this will do, it'll take the sales from that employee and multiply it by the sales adjustment for that employee. And it'll produce an output for that. And that output, or I will call, I will refer to as um, adjusted sales. And I think I actually have to go inside this parenthesis. There we go. I can await this, uh, this for each. And this aggregation now will have this adjusted sales figure um, stored in it. And I can say um, console.write line aggregation sub adjusted sales. And what that will do, yeah. when I run it, it'll show you what that adjusted sales figure is for each employee. But now it gets really, it gets even neater. Though. So like, if I want to group all of my employees together by like their department name, and I want to calculate the adjusted sales for all the employee departments and find the maximum, um, the maximum of those, uh, for a particular department, I can do that. So I will just do another await for each of our aggregation and employee aggregations dot um, group by. In this group by, I can pass in the record shell dot department name. So now I've grouped everything by department name, but first I probably want to run a supply function. Sorry. So I will say uh, employee aggregations dot apply use that same apply function um then group by and group by the department name and then i could use something really neat like um i could run a reducer and say uh dot sum and pass in the adjusted sales figure that I just calculated up here. And then I can do an order by sending. So I get the highest first down to the last. 
Um, and I can say X sub adjusted sales sum. And then I could just print out the departments with the best adjusted sales. And I can order them. So couple that right line, and I can pass in aggregation sub adjusted sales. So that will um, also that right line departments adjusted sales. That will let me order those all by their adjusted sales. So another really neat thing that you can do, you can basically chain a bunch of these applied functions together. Um, you can group them, group them together by different attributes. You can sum them. You can change the ordering of a bunch of them. Really quite powerful, this tool. And then like, for example, say you had a sales call somewhere in the world. All right. So like we have this, this location here. All right. And say we had a, we want to perform like a sales call, some random place on the map. So I'll go to maps.google.com and just drop a pin somewhere here. I guess somewhere in Virginia. There we go. So I have uh, just a random place in Virginia that I want to essentially perform a sales call to. Um, I have to reverse this because um, there's some inconsistency between how credit stores geolocations and how um, what is it Google Maps does. But anyway, I can take this geolocation and I can find how far all of my sales representatives are from there by saying um, for each bar aggregation in employee aggregations but, uh, apply. And I could say apply functions dot geo distance and pass in dot record shell dot location and geo lock. So that's the location that sales call. And I could say that's the distance from sales call. And I can say that. So that right line, um, aggregation sub I can just print it out. It'll print out that everyone's distance from the sales call in meters. And so you can just adjust it from there. But yeah, that's about all I have for redisone.net. Um, yeah, hopefully that was informative for folks. A pretty neat tool. Awesome. Thank you so Thank you. much, Steve, for showing us that. I've I've actually seen this presentation before, and I love the progress you've made and just the way it reads. Again, Redis Ohm has increased the semantics uh, or the, the, the ability to, to write like you speak, and it's just been absolutely amazing to see the progress with uh, .NET. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. It's fun. It's a good time. All right. Well, um, that is actually our Redis Live and just a little bit of Administ trivia. Um, if you would like to see more of us more consistently, please uh, join us on meetups.redis.com to stay informed as far as when our, the next Redis Live will be happening. Um, also, if you're watching on Twitch, subscribe to us on YouTube, please. And if you're watching us on YouTube, subscribe to us on Twitch. Uh, there's always uh, something that we'd love for, for you to join us. Um, also, Redis Discord is very, very strong and thriving. We uh, are constantly on our Discord channel answering questions, um, asking questions of you as far as your usage and what you prefer and things like that. And it's a really great, strong community uh, for you to seek answers and seek inspiration 
uh, and vice versa. We get our inspiration from you as well. So please join our Discord channel. As always, check out our main Twitter um, at Redis Inc. And look at our individual Twitter channels. We're always finding something new. Um, also, Redis Monthly Live is a living, breathing, streaming document of sorts. So please uh, consider uh, coming to us and offering up your knowledge and sharing your expertise and uh, your you know, experience with Redis. So we would love for, to have you up on here uh, talking along with us. Um, so, uh, you know, as always, feel free to, to reach out to us and, uh, you know, send us your pitch. All right, so I'm going to bring everybody back. Let's bring back Steve and Simon and Guy. And, uh, yeah, I want to thank all of you. Oh, where's Guy? Where's Brian? There he is. Young Day style Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not Brian, it's L. Brian. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so his wanna... first name is Larry. It's L. Brian. <laughs> I don't get it. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank all of you uh, very much for uh, your, your huge amount of contribution to uh, the Redis client home. And um, I want to open up the floor to anybody who wants to just sort of uh, chirp out what you're currently working on as far as fun or anything. I know we're doing some seasonal uh, activities as far as coding. Um, Simon and I are working on uh, DevSember. So tomorrow, I'm going to be on our DevSember stream. Uh, it's on YouTube. So check that out for the schedule. I think it's 12 p.m. PST. I'm going to be talking about PubSub. And uh, I believe later this week, I'll be talking about uh, geospatial as well. So cool stuff. And uh, let's go uh, clockwise. Uh, Steve, anything you want to throw out there? I am working on uh, taking vacation starting tomorrow, so oh, nice. you know, that's that's what I'm working on. But um, well, uh, so a lot of what I've been working on was you know, a lot of questions that we've had coming from the Redis community about RedisM.net. Um, I think probably next month I have one or two talks that I'm giving, and uh, I have a few articles that I want to write specifically on caching client side caching with .NET and Redis. So, I mean, that's what I'm up to. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Simon, is there anything in your quadrant? Uh, yeah, I'll be appearing a little bit on the December video streams and a little bit more pressing the buttons behind the things to make everybody else's uh, show work smoothly. Um, as Justin said, we're also working on a new course, which is RU204, which is basically going to be how to uh, perform Redis search operations over JSON data types. And all of these clients will be a part of that course, um, but in a sort of secondary way. So we're going to teach about how to do it. And then we're going to have like a module for each client for, um, you know, you're obviously going to do this in a particular programming language, but you don't need to know all the languages to be successful with the course. Um, then tomorrow we have fresh course runs start at Redis University. So if you go sign up tomorrow at university.redis.com, all of those courses will be available for six weeks. So if you've got nothing else to do over the holiday period, you can check into those and we'll support you as best we can over Discord. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Guy, what's going on with you? Oh, uh, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been streaming a lot lately on, on my own Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash Guy Royce. Um, I've been doing uh, the advent of code. Um, uh, I'm in theory every day, but in practice, not every day at all. Uh, and so I haven't done it in a couple days, but I'm a little bit behind. Uh, but it's a it's a, a daily coding channel uh, challenge from uh, December 1st through December 25th. Uh, and so I've been uh, foolishly uh, streaming problems that I don't even know what they are until I get on stream. And then I just start figuring them out. Uh, so I've been doing that. Uh, I'm also going to be adding some more capabilities to Redis Home. Um, there's a lot of things I'd like to add yet to it. Uh, I, you know, I don't have geo fields. Um, I'd like to add, add a date type in addition to, you know, so dates don't have to be numbers. You can actually get a proper date type. Um, I, I don't have the fancy aggregations like Steve does. That's, you know, so there's a bunch of things I want to add um, to Redis Home as well. And so I think I'll be working on that quite a bit. Um, next month, um, I'm going to be speaking at CodeMash up in Sandusky, Ohio, uh, which is a, um, uh, Brian's going to be there too, actually, uh, <laughs> uh, which, uh, you know, January on Lake Erie. I mean, you know, what could be better? Uh, <laughs> <Hold> me. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
but it's a tech conference of like 3,500 people that meet up and, you know, there, there's this idea that like code mash is um, the kind of conference you want to speak at because anyone that's willing to brave the Ohio winter on Lake Erie to go to learn about technology in the middle of January is the kind of person you want to talk to. Right. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's its big, big selling point. Plus it's at an indoor water park. So there's, there's that, but so that's what I've got coming up in the near future. Um, Steve and I were going to be speaking in London in January, but uh, uh, plans have been altered. <laughs> it's going to be May now. It's going to be May now. Yeah, it's been moved to May. Wow. So we'll be uh, hopefully going to London in May instead. Yep. And Brian. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, yes. I'm super excited to, uh, to go to Ohio. It's been a while. And uh, yes, you know, I, I need a tan. So, hey. What better place? <laughs> you get that sun reflection from the snow. <laughs> um, and uh, other than that, for Redis, uh, uh, Redis Own Spring, I'm going to do a survey of what everybody has done in their libraries and uh, see if I can equalize, you know, whatever um, I'm missing parts. Given Spring has a whole different operation model than, than most other you know, slightly lower level libraries, but uh, but I think we can uh, we can add some some fun things in there because everybody has you know added amazing ideas to their library. So, and you know, I, I think it would be good for us to present you know a a somewhat unified API ish um, front. So, awesome. but yeah, fun stuff, fun stuff. Well, thank you again, everybody, uh, for presenting today. Um, thank you, the viewers. Special shout out to Jose and Raj and Jeremiah, um, all of you for uh, you know coming in and giving us some sweet praise. We really, truly enjoy that. Um, also, if you want to be a talking head on this screen right between Brian and Guy, uh, we are hiring for a Python dev advocate. So please check that out within our career section of our website or contact one of us. Uh, via all the channels that we've talked about previously, and um, we'll get you sorted out. So, um, I got a quick question too. Uh, yeah. Simon, do we care where in the world our uh, prospective uh, Python uh, programmer is from, or our developer advocate is from? Um, not particularly. So, we're a remote team, um, and Redis already operates in many different countries. Probably, if it's one of those, that's kind of an easier path. But no, it doesn't have to be the United States, which is what it says on the job ad. We have team members across the US. I'm in the United Kingdom. Um, we also have members as far afield as Israel and Sweden right now. Cool. cool. All right. Well, everybody, thank you again for watching and enjoy the rest of your Monday and your week. And I hope to see you again soon. See you, everybody. See y'all next month. Thanks. See ya.